Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. And again, thanks for the, the invite to give a talk. <clears throat> so um, this talk is about Marx's theory of the origin of profit in human labor and uh, a criticism of it, which objects that machines also perform work and therefore Marx's theory is wrong. So my title is also a question because although I'll give my answer, this topic definitely deserves more thought. So I hope it will stimulate uh, some good discussion. So let's begin by stating a contradiction. And let me also begin by sharing my screen. I hope that works okay. Brilliant. Okay. So on the left, Marx states that human labor is a unique special factor of production because it, uh, it alone creates economic value. Labor creates value, nothing else does. On the right, Marx points out that some machines can act autonomously, almost with a will of their own and perform tasks that we can't do. I'm gonna use the term machine quite broadly to include any non-human system that performs work in a strict thermodynamic sense. Now, most machines are, are dumb, lifeless things. The pen that you hold in your hand is a machine of a kind. It's a system with the causal power to transmit stored ink at a constant rate to its tip. And obviously its causal powers are hugely limited compared to what humans can do. Other machines are mechanically powerful, for example, diggers that move tons of earth more quickly than any team of humans. Other machines are cognitively powerful, for example, supercomputers that predict the weather or neural networks that can translate between languages. And our machines are becoming increasingly sophisticated, replicating and exceeding our physical and mental powers in many domains. We don't produce things on our own. We work with artificial machines and naturally evolved machines such as animals and plants. All these systems supply work, which is labor of a kind to production. The horse that pulls the cart works just as hard as the worker who loads it. And due to these obvious facts, a popular and widespread objection to Marx's theory of surplus value is that human labor is not special. Human labor cannot be the only factor of production that creates profit. And this is the basic contradiction that we'll explore in this talk. Marx theory states that human labor alone creates value, but there's no real difference in principle between human and machine labor. And therefore Marx's theory of value is considered to be wrong. So I want to begin uh, with the case for humans. I want to spend the next uh, 10 minutes briefly reviewing Marx's theory of surplus value. Now, Marx's theory explains how capitalism produces more than what's needed to sustain the population by devoting surplus working time to the production of goods and services for an exploiting class and also new means of production such as machinery which increases the productivity of labor leading to economic growth in a spiral of capital accumulation. Marx here isn't concerned with explaining profit from market arbitrage where a trader notices an opportunity to buy low and sell high. That's a zero sum transfer. What someone gains, another person loses. Buying low and selling high isn't how economies grow and develop their forces of production. Marx instead wants to understand the link between structural changes in the conditions of production, specifically how much labor time is required to produce commodities and changes in monetary profit. So Marx, when presenting the essentials of this theory, he assumes that firms use the same techniques of production, that no monopolies exist, that supply and demand are in balance, and so profits aren't being made due to temporary scarcity and so on. All right, so let's consider any production process. It has some inputs which need to be bought on the market, and it has some outputs which are sold on the market. And workers during their working day transform raw materials into new output aided by tools and machinery. And Marx uses the term constant capital to collectively refer to these inputs. Every commodity has a price in the market and a labor value, which is the quantity of direct and indirect labor needed to produce it. In general, prices don't equal labor values, but in order to abstract from price value mismatches, Marx in volume one assumes that they are proportional. Okay, first, 
Marx states that workers during the labor process transfer the value of constant capital to the value of the output. Let's make that uh, really concrete. Imagine you're a chef in a restaurant chopping up vegetables and frying. The purchase cost of the vegetables reappears as part of the cost of the finished meal on the plate. Your cooking labor transfers this value to the output. And another way of thinking about this is to simply observe that profit creating labor must always produce an output with a selling price that exceeds the cost of all the raw materials that were used up to make it. Now, some constant capital isn't completely used up during this process. Every time a worker uses a machine, it deteriorates just a little bit. Machines, unlike raw materials, aren't entirely consumed um, in one production process, but persist over many. So for example, the oven in the restaurant heats many meals before it breaks down and requires fixing. Workers, therefore, also transfer the value of fixed machinery, such as ovens, fridges, microwaves, etc., bit by bit, amortize over multiple outputs as the machinery depreciates through use. And again, another way of thinking about this is to simply observe that profit creating labor must also produce an output with a selling price that covers the cost of running, maintaining, and replacing any machinery. And so the value of the constant capital reappears in the output. And so far during the working day, the value of the inputs are conserved in the production process. They reappear in the output. Okay, so Marx uses the term variable capital to denote the labor power that's employed in the production process. In our restaurant example, uh, the variable cap capital would be the chef, line cooks, waiters, and so on. The value of labor power is the value of the real wage, which is the, the direct and indirect labor time needed to produce the goods and services that workers consume. And so workers during their working day also transfer the value of the real wage to, their, to the output, and therefore both human and non-human costs of production are conserved and reappear in the output. <clears throat> so uh, zooming out from the restaurant, imagine this happened in every sector of the economy, total constant capital is used up and replaced, the total real wage is consumed and replaced, firms sell their goods in the market and cover their input costs, workers then get paid sufficient wages to purchase that real wage. In this situation, there are no profits and there is no growth, the economy would just reproduce itself over time at the same scale. But this doesn't happen, there is profit and there is growth, and so where does this come from? And now we get to Marx's uh, crucial claim. Human labor is special because it's the only factor of production that adds more value than its own cost. Workers create value by working even longer than what's necessary to replace their real wage. In other words, for profit to be possible, the value of the output must be greater than the value of the input. This excess of value Marx calls surplus value. And in consequence, the total working day of society has a necessary part, which reproduces the value of the capital stock and the real wage, but also a surplus part, over and above what's necessary, that produces additional goods and services. These additional goods and, and services are purchased with profit income and take the form of luxury goods for capitalists and new capital stock to grow the economy. So how does human labor actually produce new surplus value? Um, Marx says basically in two fundamental ways. The first way Marx calls the production of absolute surplus value. Capitalists can increase their profits by getting workers to work either longer or work more intensely. This pumps more work out of them and therefore greater output. And therefore workers add even more value to the economy over and above what they take out in the form of the real wage. Longer hours directly increase the length of the working day working more intensely makes every hour of the working day count for more. Either way, more surplus value is produced. So a busy restaurant can produce more meals per hour by demanding that the chef and the cooks work harder. Their wages are the same, but they're producing more meals and that means more profit for the owners. Okay, that's the first way. But uh, there are only so many hours in a day and workers hit their natural limits. So the second method of creating new value is the production of 
relative surplus value, and it's quite different. Workers produce relative surplus value when they develop new techniques of production that reduce the value of the real wage. In other words, the productivity of labor in sectors that produce the real wage increases. And when this happens, less of society's labor time is needed to produce the goods and services that workers consume. And in this scenario, workers work the same hours at the same intensity, it's just that the value of the real wage is now lower. This has the effect of reducing input costs for capitalists because the value of labor power decreases. So for example, the chef at the restaurant needs to eat, buy clothes, live in a warm house, have running water, have internet access, enjoy nights out, et cetera, et cetera. The chef's wage pays for this bundle of goods and services. But if other workers discover new, more efficient methods to produce food or clothes or heat, or they develop um, new communication technologies that use less power or create new software that can distribute movies over the internet, reduce packaging and transportation costs and so on and so on, then the quantity of society's labor time necessary to supply the chef's real wage reduces. Technical innovation can be labor saving. And that means if the chef supplies the same number of hours but takes out in the form of consumption goods less hours due to the technical innovations, then the chef overall supplies more surplus labor time and therefore more surplus value is produced and therefore more profit for capitalists. Um, now, just as an aside, labor saving technical change can take many forms, not just new kinds of machinery. More efficient techniques can be obtained from better methods of production, uh, better, sorry, better methods of organization, uh, cooperation at larger scales, more specialized division of labor. But in each case, the outcome is the same, which is an increased productivity of labor. All right. So in summary, two main methods by which human labor and human labor alone creates profit. First, by working longer or at a higher intensity, and second, by developing technical innovations that reduce the value of labor power. So workers, according to Marx, compared to all the other factors of production, such as machines, can work harder and therefore produce absolute surplus value, or they can work smarter and therefore produce relative surplus value. And this is why Marx splits capital into constant and variable parts. He wants to draw a sharp contrast between the causal powers of human and non-human factors in the process of production. Constant capital is a passive component. Its value just passes into the output. But variable capital is the subjective active component and what value it adds isn't fixed, isn't conserved, but can alter. And that in summary, is Marx's theory of the origin of surplus value in human labor. The cause of profit ultimately is, according to Marx, human labor because it, and only it, can work harder and work smarter. Okay. Let's now turn to an objection uh, to this theory. And the objection ultimately reduces to pointing out an identity between human and non-human labor. When we produce stuff, we always need the help of other things. We need raw materials, a place to work, machinery. And in the strict thermodynamic sense, we don't do all the work. For example, machines clearly do work, powered by diesel engines or electricity or some other source of energy. In some industries, especially in poorer countries, animals are yoked to provide motive power, so they work uh, too. And although we sow the seeds, till the soil, water plants, it's the natural capabilities of the plant, its ability to convert matter into new forms by harnessing the energy from sunlight that also in the strict thermodynamic sense contributes a type of work. So any economic output is jointly caused by human work combined with non-human work. We always mix our labor with other factors of production, such as land and capital. Production is not only a labor process, but it's also a natural process and a machine process. The fact uh, that we can automate particular types of human work in the form of machines, including more recently virtual machines in the form of computer software, directly indicates 
that human and machine work are in an important sense, identical. The types of work we once thought were beyond the reach of mechanization have now been mechanized. And there's no reason to think that there's a technological limit to this process uh, because materialists should accept the proposition that all human labor could in principle uh, be mechanized because materialism isn't the idea that everything is ultimately reducible to the um, click and clack of uh, billiard ball atoms. Materialism, uh, as far as I see it, and at least in the context of the history of Marxism, is the idea that everything is ultimately the lawful emanation of a single substance that in principle is intelligible to our own minds precisely because our minds are also an emanation of that same substance. So materialists typically don't believe that the causal powers of human labor are miraculous exceptions to the laws of the material world. And therefore, in principle, we can reverse engineer our own capabilities, even if that might take a millennia of effort and ingenuity. And in a way, we already have empirical evidence that the causal powers of humans can be engineered into existence because humans are machines of a kind. They just happen to be machines created by evolution and made from skin, bones, and neurons. And if our causal powers seem special, it's because we're the only mechanisms that we currently know that have them. Our specialness is simply an accident of our point in history. We're learning how to replicate more and more of our capabilities. And this technological trajectory and this possibility raises a problem for Marx's claim that human labor is special. To illustrate this point, let's consider a thought experiment, a kind of Turing test uh, for Marx's theory. So Alan Turing uh, devised a test to determine and decide whether a machine is intelligent. He wanted to avoid objections to the idea that machines can think based on religious belief in the existence of an ineffable soul or the unverifiable claim that only humans can have first person consciousness. He understood that from an objective perspective, intelligent thought ultimately manifests as public behavior in a social context. So Turing proposed to hide the machine behind a screen and allow the public to interact with it by submitting and receiving written responses. If the public can't tell whether they're interacting with a real human or a machine, then the AI passes the test and should by any objective criteria be considered intelligent. And we're going to adapt uh, Turing's test and apply it to Marx's theory of surplus value. Let's consider a particular kind of work. It could be anything, but we'll choose taxi driving. <coughs> the taxi driver works for a big company. The company is not a worker co-op, so the taxi driver doesn't get the full value of their output and make a profit for their owners. Let's think of an Uber or a Lyft. Imagine we put the taxi driver in a box so they're hidden from view. Customers can still talk to the driver, tell them where they want to go, pay with a cashless card. So everything works as normal, except the driver can't be seen. Now, imagine we replace the taxi driver in the box with a robot. The machine does everything the taxi driver did. It can take instructions, it can take payments, and it can drive. So uh, not so long ago, the idea that taxi driving could be automated was science fiction. But in fact, both Uber and Lyft are trying right now uh, to automate it. They know they'll be more profitable if they can replace human labor, something that's more efficient, less likely to unionize. So these companies are already searching for ways to produce relative surplus value. Anyhow, let's assume that the production and maintenance costs of robot taxi drivers are identical to the wages of the human taxi drivers. Machines actually deployed in production typically perform their tasks um, 
often better than humans. So we'd expect that robot taxis would drive safer, find better routes, drive optimally to minimize gas costs. But let's assume that the inputs and outputs of the box remain identical after this change. What the human taxi driver once did, the machine now does in exactly the same way. So customers can't tell the difference. Before that, there was a box that acted like a taxi driver. After there is a box that acts like a taxi driver, the machine passes the Turing test for being a taxi driver. And so under the conditions of our thought experiment, <clears throat> If we swapped out human taxi drivers for robot taxi drivers right now, today, all at once, then the profits of an Uber or a Lyft would be the same. Nothing would change. And the work of the robot taxi driver transfers the value of inputs, the cost of gas, the maintenance cost of the car, and so on, to its output the machine seems to transfer value. And since profits are the same, then this machine appears to add more value than what it consumes in the form of electricity, replacement parts, and maintenance costs. So here we have a mechanical, not human labor, producing a surplus of value or profit. The only condition that changed in the before and after is that the labor of taxi driving was first performed by something we called a human, and then it was performed by something we called a machine. So this thought experiment seems to demonstrate quite clearly that human labor cannot be special. Any kind of labor, whether it's human, natural or artificial, supplies work and can therefore in the right circumstances produce profit. And this seems to be a knockdown argument against Marx's theory of the origin of profit. So Typically, uh, when people, well, in my experience, when people first learn of Marx's theory of surplus value, they will quickly object that machine labor isn't really different from human labor. And so this sort of argument is often made, although not explicitly in terms of a, a Turing test. So Marxists over the years have responded to this argument, uh, but I think most of the responses are in various ways inadequate. So let's spend a little bit of time to consider some typical responses. <clears throat> Social relations. So a popular Marxist response is to reiterate that economic value is a social relation between people. The substance of value, what money and magnitude such as profit actually refer to or represent is abstract human labor time. Profit as Marx told us is fundamentally surplus value and surplus value by definition is the difference between the labor time workers supply to production and the labor time they consume in the form of the real wage. And therefore, we should reject this thought experiment because it completely misses the point. However, the problem with this response is that it merely restates Marx's theory of surplus value. And in this sense, it's a dogmatic response because it doesn't engage with the thought experiment. Whether the substance of profit really is human labor time and whether the cause of profit really is human work alone is precisely what is questioned by this thought experiment. Critics of Marxist theory have correctly pointed out that the objective cost structure of an economy can be measured in multiple ways, not just by labor time. We can equally talk of surplus oil value, surplus corn value, surplus energy value. In fact, any commodity that's a basic input. And this dogmatic response leaves itself open to this critique because it reduces Marx's theory to a mere real cost accounting method where we subjectively choose labor time as our preferred measure of objective costs. But that isn't Marx's theory. Marx aims to show that it is human labor that objectively creates surplus value in the production process independently of our subjective choice about how to measure real costs. So it's no good to simply repeat that value is a social relation amongst people. Of course it is. Without human industry and commerce, there wouldn't even be economic phenomena to puzzle over, but it doesn't follow that the origin of profit is human labor alone. Okay, 
Another response, inspired by a, a powerful passage Marx wrote in a letter to his friend Ludwig Kugelmann, is to point out that any society, in order to reproduce itself, must allocate the total labor time to different ends. It needs a way to assign humans different parts of the division of labor, so the right things get produced in the right quantities. And in capitalism, this happens predominantly via markets and money, and therefore money magnitudes such as profit ultimately refer to human labor time. Marx's letter, in my view, contains the most important passage written in the history of economics. But the fact that human labor time must be organized does not establish that human labor is a unique cause of profit. Capitalism allocates and organizes all other kinds of resources, not just human labor, including natural resources such as land and produce resources such as capital equipment. Another response is to claim that uh, human labor is special because it's the universal input to every production process. Even capital intensive, highly automated production involves human labor. Dedicated machines uh, like combine harvesters, they're only employed in certain sectors of production. In contrast, humans are employed everywhere. The problem with this argument is that although human labor is indeed pres present in every production process, it doesn't mean that it and it alone creates profit because human labor is combined with non-human factors in every production process. Okay, um, another response is to say, well, it's only humans that are living self-reproducing systems and therefore capable of maintaining their own bodily existence. We've created the economy precisely to reproduce ourselves through time. Without us, the economy would fall apart. <clears throat> and um, this, is, this is true, but human labor is not unique in this. Animals are also living systems capable of reproducing themselves without our help. They also are involved in production. And without the self-reproducing capabilities of the natural world, our economies would quickly fall apart. We can even imagine that the robot taxi driver has algorithms to monitor its own health and has the capability to order replacement parts, including the human labor needed to install them. So simply being able to maintain oneself doesn't distinguish human from non-human labor. And anyway, this capability seems just unrelated to the creation of profit. Marx observes, uh, begin quote, um, what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is that the architect builds the cell in his mind before he constructs it in wax, end quote. So Marx here is drawing a contrast between the planned goal-directed activity of humans compared to machines that simply follow blind rules. Now it's true that human imagination surpasses any machine but it's not true that only humans are goal-directed. All animals and all sophisticated robots formulate plans and follow goals of a kind. And for the purpose of producing surplus value, all that matters is behavior, not how that behavior is ultimately generated. A beehive is a beehive regardless of whether it was produced by a smart machine or a dumb machine. Another response is to observe that only workers struggle with capitalists over the length of the working day, and only workers can organize themselves to agitate for higher wages and grab a greater share of the surplus value they create. Machines don't advocate for themselves. This is obviously true, but we can flip this argument and point out that capitalists as a class are in many ways much more successful at organizing themselves to grab increasing shares of society's surplus labor time. Would we want to therefore claim that capitalists create surplus value? So this response doesn't speak to the Turing test at all. The fact that workers have the capability to struggle for a greater share of the profit doesn't imply that they are the cause of it. Another response is to observe 
that humans, unlike machines, can refuse their labor, they can withdraw it, they can go on strike and prevent profits being made at all. But machines <clears throat> break down all the time and then profit also stops. And some machines already decide, although in a very rudimentary manner at the moment, to withdraw their work via fail-safe mechanisms that are designed to prevent overheating or mechanical breakage. So all the factors of production need to work uh, together to produce profits and any factor, human or machine, can stop working at any time. So the problem with this response is that it explains why value is sometimes not produced, but it doesn't establish that humans uniquely create value when they agree to work. Uh, another response is to acknowledge the contribution of machines, but point out that it's humans that actively decide uh, to produce things, that direct and control the production process. And that without us, nothing would happen at all. In other words, we are causally responsible for the output and therefore the cause of surplus value. However, who or what has ultimate causal responsibility is not that clear. For example, in some production processes, uh, the machines are in control. So Marx in his fragment on machines notes that, begin quote, uh, the worker's activity is reduced to a mere abstraction of activity, is determined and regulated on all sides by the movement of machinery, end quote. And uh, the imperative to produce surplus value ultimately derives from the impersonal and objective laws of capitalist competition. In this sense, workers are not in control of production, but wage slave automata dominated and controlled by the rule of capital. And another response is to point out that machines are our creations. We produce them, they don't produce us. They are past examples of humans working smarter. And therefore anything that a machine does is really attributable to human labor. However, but there's never been a time when humans work without the help of natural or artificial machines. All machines are also jointly created by past machines. So there are kernels of truth to all those responses, but none <clears throat> are successful responses to the Turing test. Turing test swaps out human labor for machine labor and profit is still being made. So contra Marx, human labor cannot be the unique value creating substance. And in addition, none of these responses directly engage with Marx's actual argument with the specific content of his theory of surplus value. Marx aims to reveal the causal mechanism within production that actually achieves capital accumulation and growth. And he claims it's achieved by people working harder or smarter. And so we still have a contradiction to resolve. So is there a problem with Marx's theory of surplus value? Or is there a problem with the thought experiment? Before answering that, I want to play a short clip that demonstrates the extraordinary powers of variable capital to change the conditions of production by working smarter. So the reason I played that clip uh, is to make it really concrete <clears throat> that humans act in highly variable ways during the process of production. The constant capital, the table, the hammer, the pins act in a constant manner and lack the general capability to notice ways to get more outputs for less inputs. So now we can state <clears throat> the fundamental problem with the Turing test thought experiment. The test compares two static situations a situation where humans perform the task of driving a taxi and a situation where robots do it in exactly the same way. And then it points out that in both cases, the level of profit remains the same. 
But Marx's theory of surplus value is fundamentally not about what determines the level of profit, but what determines changes in the level of profit. Marx defines the production of new absolute surplus value by a change in the length of the working day, or a change in the intensity of work. And he defines the production of new relative surplus value by a change in the techniques of production. So Marx's theory is about the cause of change in the level of profit due to a change in the conditions of production. And in this respect, Marx's theory is irreducibly and fundamentally a dynamic theory of changes in profit over historical time. But the Turing test thought experiment doesn't consider a change in profits at all. And it doesn't consider what happens in historical time. And as Marx himself pointed out, his theory of surplus value is entirely compatible with individual firms replacing humans with machines and retaining or even increasing their current level of profits, at least initially. And this means that Marx is claiming that changes in the general level of profits are ultimately caused by human labor and human labor alone isn't contradicted by this thought experiment. And that's why the thought experiment misses its mark. So to make this point even clearer, let's extend the duration of the Turing test. Consider that Uber has switched to robot taxi drivers, but Lyft has stuck with the humans. By assumption, their profit levels start out identical. But let's imagine that due to changes in the wider economy, there's new demand for home deliveries of restaurant food. Now the robot taxi drivers have no idea about this new demand because their sensory input doesn't include it. Even if it did, the algorithms can't process this data and infer there's an opportunity to make some extra money. In contrast, the human taxi drivers spot this new trend and realize they can also taxi food around in between a normal business and make more money. And so very soon, the profits of Uber and Lyft diverge. Lyft's profits are greater because it's starting to capture a share of the market for food delivery. And why? Because human taxi drivers quite spontaneously innovated. Human labor, unlike machine labor, is variable and it can adapt to new circumstances and change its own conditions of production. Machines can reproduce an existing level of profit for a time, but they can't in general change the level of profit. So as soon as we introduce historical time to the Turing test, we immediately see the machines fail to pass it. And so we've arrived at a response to this common objection to Marx's theory of surplus value. And I call it the, the causal powers response because it's based on what humans and only humans can actually do their capabilities that actually manifest in material activity in the hidden abode of production. Humans have universal causal powers, whereas machines merely have particular causal powers. And this means that only labor power has the capability to work harder and smarter in every production process to cause changes in the level of profits. Of course, any particular activity performed by humans can in principle be mechanized, but as of today, no machine matches the universal causal powers of humans. The taxi driver in a box thought experiment correctly assumed that the behavior of humans and machines can be identical, but it's quite wrong to assume that the causal powers of humans and machines are identical. The causal powers of humans are in general very different to any current machines or any other mechanism that we know of. We can imagine putting any type of current human activity into a hypothetical box and then replacing it with a current or future machine and the level of profits for a while will remain unaltered. But when human labor is involved in a production process, that process gets much more than a dedicated mechanism that performs a concrete task. Human labor is a whole collection of capabilities that transcend any concrete task. Very quickly, we'll find ways to change the conditions of production and create new surplus value. And why? 
because humans are endlessly inventive and creative and adaptable. Our imagines, imaginations are prodigious. We learn by doing. Animals, machines, and plants simply don't have these causal powers. Our causal powers are precisely those that can't really be kept in the box, but will always overspill it. So machines cannot in general act to change the level of profits, but humans can. And that's what Marx's theory of surplus value is driving at. Now this conclusion should be common sense, but there's enormous ideological pressure to deny the agency of workers, to deny our causal responsibility for producing the economic output. Capitalist owners who fund production see their money visibly manifest as constant capital before their eyes. They can literally kick their contributions to production. This, it seems to them, is the material embodiment of their contribution to the output as clear as day. It's an empirical fact that the introduction of machinery can expel human labor and yet generate higher profits. A company with a first mover advantage will enjoy super profits until their competitors catch up. So capitalists introduce machinery and see profits rise. So much for the claims of labor and so much for Marx's theory of the origin of profit. But as we've seen, variable capital, that is human labor, is the cause of changes in profit, not constant capital. And so what capitalists are really seeing is changes in profitability due to other workers in other enterprises working harder or smarter to create the machines their money capital buys. So in the individual enterprise, especially from the point of view of capitalists, the real cause of changes in profitability is hidden. And it's for reasons like this that Marx speaks of an ideological inversion. Uh, begin quote, uh, this complete inversion of the relation between dead and living labor, between value and the force that creates value, mirrors itself in the consciousness of capitalists, end quote. But not just capitalists, but the population as a whole. The deprecation of the agency of human labor is really pronounced and it's really pervasive. Everyone falls for it, even highly trained economists and philosophers. Capitalist ideology, especially in economic reports, stresses that profit and growth is created by investments. The active role is given to capital, not labor. Or alternatively, we're told that profit is due to the actions of heroic entrepreneurs. So some entrepreneurs actually do work rather than simply funding it. Uh, so for example, the contributions of more technically advanced workers, which includes the work of applying new technology to meet unmet demand, that's typically bundled together and conflated with firm ownership. So this cutting edge work can be highly rewarded, especially if the technical founders have ownership stakes in the firm. And so the enormous mismatch between their financial rewards compared to the majority of workers, financial rewards that are predominantly gained from equity, not wages, and therefore mostly derived from the work of others, not their own, further contributes to this ideological separation of their labor into a special category. So even when it's clearly teams of cooperating workers that create new profit, these workers are classified as special inventors, wealth creators, innovators. God forbid that their labor be classified as just another type of labor and they're, therefore their contributions, contributions viewed as exa of exactly the same kind as those of the great majority of people. So apart from a few innovators, capitalist ideology in general denigrates or ignores or denies the unique value creating powers of human labor. It downplays the agency of the working class. But capitalism also materially restricts the agency of workers. Capital demands that millions discipline themselves to perform highly specialized, repetitive and narrow tasks. And so for many, the activity of working means to act like a machine. So many workers, although capable of it, having the causal powers, don't get the opportunity to innovate and produce new relative surplus value. Most habitually repeat the same processes day in, day out, and therefore reproduce the same levels of surplus value. 
Capitalist ideology represses the idea that human labor creates economic value because otherwise the claims of capital on it would be weakened. So the image of the worker in capitalist society is neither heroic, innovative, creative, or inventive, even though in every case, workers are capable of doing just that. So it looks like we're done. We've explained why humans and not machines create value. No other agency or mechanism comes close to rivaling our causal powers. We are truly at the apex of intelligence on earth, embodiments of abstract labor, universal machines. At any point in time, the world's division of labor includes a spectrum of concrete labor activities that range from well-defined, repetitive, semi-automatic tasks to ill-defined, ever-changing, creative tasks. This spectrum doesn't map neatly onto the division between manual and intellectual labor. Some predominantly physical tasks aren't going to be automated anytime soon. In contrast, some predominantly intellectual tasks are in the process of becoming automated. Human labor replaces aspects of its own general causal powers with dedicated machinery. And so human labor driven by the profit motive is continually expelled from the division of labor thrown into unemployment, where it must attempt once again to fit into a new division of labor and compete with other humans and other machines in the labor market. But no machines of our creation are able to match our ability to produce surplus value and compete with us in the labor market. Our current machines are simply fragments of concrete labor and being fixed and limited fragments, they will eventually become obsolete and outdated. They can't change and keep up with us. Today, they might look shiny, but soon they will tarnish and get old, and then we'll toss them without thought onto the proverbial scrap heap. So let's make that causal powers thesis very concrete. <clears throat> At random, pick an example of constant capital that exists in the world today. There's a good chance it will be a brick, a chair, a pen, perhaps a computer chip, the prob probability that it will work harder or smarter in production is zero. In contrast, randomly pick an example of variable capital. That's a living human being. Many of us most of the time repeat the same habitual production activities and therefore reproduce existing levels of surplus value. But the probability that we will change our conditions of production by working harder or smarter is non-zero, it's positive. And when we do, we produce new surplus value and therefore causes cause changes in profitability. <clears throat> and so we're done, at least for the purpose of pointing out the flaws and misunderstandings of critics who claim that machines can create value and therefore Marxist theory of profit is wrong. And uh, to avoid any possible uh, controversy down the line, I should stop here, having defended the orthodox position, even if in a somewhat unorthodox uh, manner. Uh, but um, I think we need to think about the historical traje trajectory. A social theory is also a kind of constant capital. It reflects social reality in thought. But the march of history alters social reality and therefore our concepts may become if not obsolete, then at least in need of refinement. Marx's distinction between constant and variable capital is a mighty one, and it's a successful one. But will it hold true forever? Or is the distinction historically contingent? Let's return to the materialist point of view that machines of a kind already create value, at least the ones called humans. And there seems no in principle limit to our ability to alienate our own powers in external machines. We're beginning to understand how to automate and mechanize aspects of our own cognition, including our ability to learn and adapt to new circumstances. For example, large scale use of distributed computing clusters with chips dedicated to performing very fast vector operations has enabled us to train huge neural networks with billions of parameters on huge volumes of data, such as the entirety of the written text available on the internet. 
these virtual machines are beginning to exhibit human level capabilities in reading, writing, translating, talking, and creating imagery. As machines replicate more and more of our causal powers, then won't they also begin to produce new surplus value? We could imagine that robot taxi drivers in the future would also notice new market opportunities. Even more advanced machines might fool the Turing test for longer and compete with us in all areas of the division of labor, at least for a while, as value creating elements for capital before their limitations are finally exposed. Such machines would not merely be constant capital, but neither would they be fully variable capital. They would be hybrid capital, able to produce surplus value for a bounded time until finally becoming obsolete. And where might this process end? There are technical limits and there are social limits imposed by the mode of production. If we escape the rule of capital, avoid civilizational collapse and continue to devote some of our time to replicating our causal powers, then the sharp distinction between human and machine labor will in all likelihood dissolve. And from the purely technical point of view, there seems every reason to think that one day we will build machines able to feed and fix themselves, learn and adapt, have the causal powers to satisfy all our demands. But such machines being our equals would in all likelihood not take any orders from us. At the at this asymptote of technical progress, a hypothetical asymptote, the embodiment of the historical spirit will no longer be limited to evolved flesh and bones, but we should expect at this point in history, a debate over which factors of production are causally responsible for the economic output, and therefore which classes might be justified in controlling its production and distribution, and which classes may not due to their parasitical redundancy, that this class struggle over the division of the surplus will be a very old historical curiosity belonging to the childhood of humanity when it allowed itself to be divided and ruled by capital. And indeed, we should expect uh, that when humans fully replicate themselves, the replicants will go further and farther than us, perhaps initiating a new age of super universal labor where sadly or fittingly the biological models will no longer be able to compete and keep up and we should hope will then be carefully quietly and with loving respect not thrown on the scrap heap as we once did to them but put to gentle pasture for our fervent hope must be that our children will surpass us greatly and so uh my answer to the question do machines create value is not yet. And uh, there I'll stop and uh, thank, thanks for listening.